Happy end of March. Happy 1st of April. Oh, am I posting this on April 1st? Should I do like a like an April Fool's joke? Uh, what about, oh, I'm going to read all the books I own before I buy any new ones. I feel like a good April Fool's joke should be at least a little bit believable, no? Hello and welcome back to my channel. My name is Jason, or as much of the internet knows me as Easy Cat. Either one is fine. Today I'm going to be doing my March reading wrap-up, talking to you about all of the books that I read in March and giving you the good, the bad, and the ugly. I started a project in March on my short-form content uh, that I might be bringing to my long-form content if I can figure out a way to do it, where basically I'm going through my bookshelf and reading uh, and going to each book one at a time from the top, and uh, if I haven't read it, I have to read it, and then otherwise I have to decide if I'm going to keep it or if I'm going to get rid of it. Uh, so kind of going through and, and like figuring out my whole collection. And what's crazy is there's so many books on this bookshelf that I haven't even read yet. Uh, so getting to read them has been really fun. And I have two books that I'll talk about today that I read because of this. And they're books that I've owned for like over three years each. So finally reading them, I thought I feel like very accomplished because of that. It seems really cool. Uh, so I'm trying to figure out a way to do that in more of a long form. The, the trouble with a long form video of that is the best way I can think to do it is like at the end of every shelf, kind of doing an overview of like what I got rid of, what I kept, all of that. But the problem is, that means that I have to keep all of the books that I would get rid of in order to make that video for possibly like months because I don't know how long it's going to take me to get through each shelf. And that seems counterproductive to be like, I'm going to get rid of this in three to four months when I finish this shelf and can talk about it. So I don't know. I have to figure out a way to do all of that. But, you know, it's it's a fun project and I'm really enjoying it. And I'm doing it in my, in my short form content for now, TikTok and Instagram. I'm going to try and do like even like really short versions of it to put on YouTube shorts. But 60 seconds is such a short amount of time. I don't know. I have to I have to see if I can manage it. <laughs> Before we get started, all of the normal things, make sure to like, make sure to subscribe. Uh, apparently there's like a notification bell if you want to know exactly when I post a video. That sounds a little intense to me, but, but but so I leave that up to you. I leave that up to you. I also have a subscriber community on Binary called Easy Cat Press. I post exclusive content there. Uh, we are also working on publishing books together there. So our first one, House of Frank, comes out October 15th, which is really cool. And then I'm, a, I'm like this close to signing my second book, which will be out sometime in 2025. At least that's the plan for right now. I'll put the link to that down below if you want to check that out. And I also have a free to join Discord. I'll put the link to that down below as well. All right, that's enough chitty chat. Let's jump into the books. Let me show you everything that I read in March and tell you what I thought of them. And these are in no particular order. And I say that because the first book I'm going to share with you is the last book that I <laughs> read in March. They're just in a random pile. I don't know what to tell you. So this is Will My Cat Eat My Eyeballs? <laughs> okay, so this book is written by Caitlin uh, Dowdy, I think is how you say their name. Uh, they are a mortician. And so their entire job is like dead bodies and death and dead things. And this book is sort of like a series of essays that are put together to answer questions that Caitlin got most often when traveling and, and doing like going to schools and talking to kids. And kids, you know, will just ask, they'll just ask the question, right? Like as adults, we sometimes get a little bit more like prude, we're a little bit more reserved. We might we might have like a really sketchy question we want to know, we want to ask this mortician, but we won't ask it because we might be embarrassed. But kids, they will just ask the question. So in this book, it's like a bunch of essays that like go over the answers to these questions that kids are asking, because of course adults are also going to probably be interested in these things. They're just they're just not as willing to to ask them. So for example, like, can I use human bones from a cremation as jewelry? Did you did you want to know the answer to that? Can you describe the smell of a dead body? <laughs> what happens when a cemetery is full of bodies and you can't add anymore? So it has all of these like very interesting uh, essays on death and dead bodies and cremation and burial. And it's it was very interesting. OK, uh, and I think what's fun about this book is it has a very like cheeky sense of humor. Uh, and so it, it's not it, it's it's giving real information, but it also is done in like a very entertaining way. And I think that was really cool. This was one of the books that I read on my bookshelf as part of my like go through every book series. I initially bought this book because I as like a joke. So my when my husband and I were trying to figure out if we were going to get cats, I really wanted cats. And you may know we own two cats. But this was years ago, we were trying to I was trying to convince him that I wanted cats. And he was not going for it because he's very animals make him very nervous. And he was a little scared of getting cats. So I got this. <laughs> 
in hindsight, not my best plan to convince him, uh, but it's like a joke, right? And uh, then I just never read it. So I finally read it. It's a very short read. It took me a day to read. I mean, less than a day. It was a very, very quick read. I don't think I'm going to be keeping it. I think I am going to probably be unhauling it from my collection, but that's not because I didn't think it was good. I thought it was really good and I, I learned a lot from it, but it's mostly for two reasons. One, because it's a nonfiction book, I have friends and family that I think would love this and I would just love to pass it along to them because I think they would read it and really enjoy it. But also like reading it often because it's like talking about death and um, things like things of that nature, it often made me feel like anxious. <laughs> like it made me feel really at times anxious, at times stressed, at times a little depressed because like I feel like I already think about death enough and so having and so reading about it just like I don't know it made me like stressed to read it even though it's like a very fun like cute way of engaging with this information it's in no way the book's fault it is me entirely like reading this gave me like I could feel my chest getting tight I was like that's what's gonna happen to me when I die they're just gonna put me in a machine and then it's gonna you know like I couldn't I couldn't handle it <laughs> I couldn't and what's funny is that I read Butcher and Blackbird and that like nothing about that book stressed me out whatsoever. I was like, oh, chill. It's about serial killers. Cool. But this book, I think it's because it's like factual information. I was like, they're going to do what to my body when I'm gone? What? <laughs> and it really, it really, it, it, it stressed me out a bit. And so uh, to that end, I don't think I'll ever reread this because I have the information now. I don't think I need to reread it, and reading it uh, stressed me out. So I would rather give this to a friend or family member that can then read it, or possibly someone else, I don't know, and then we can chat about it. Then we can have a discussion about it. Uh, but I I did really like it. I think it was a really good book. It just, it just it's, at times it was a little much for me. I don't know if I'm squeamish, or maybe I'm just like kind of nervous about the idea of death and dead bodies, which is, I it's, that's normal, right? Like, that's a normal that's a normal thing to be. Uh, but it did, at times I just was like, okay, I whoosh, I woof, I need to take a break. <laughs> yes, this was great. And if you have these questions and you know what, I don't know if the, the book feels like it's written for kids, but I don't know if I would say it's necessarily always like kid appropriate. So if you are an adult with kids that have these questions, what I would suggest is maybe read this book and then decide if you want to read it with them, or if you want to like give them the cliff notes edition of like, well, this, 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 and this, and this. Um, there's just a couple parts of the book where I was like, oh, would kids, would kids be reading this? I don't know. So uh, I, I think it's made to be read by kids, but I also, it, it has like pictures in it. Like, wow, art. But you might want to check it out before you pass it on to your kid. Cause you know, you know your kids way better than I do. I'm some stranger on the internet that knows nothing. So if you are going to engage with this with your kids, which I think you absolutely could, I would just have you do a little pre-screen of the information and what you're reading, what they're going to be, the information they're going to be taking in and how they're taking it in before, you know, making sure that they can handle it. Because I'm a grown adult and there were times I couldn't handle it. So there you go. So this month for Easy Cats Book Club, uh, which is a free to join book club. You know what? I'll put the link to that down below as well. It's, it's hosted on Fable. We read Song of Silver, Flame Like Night. Look at this cover, first of all. Hello. Uh, I loved this. So this is the first book in a duology. I bought the second book uh, after I finished this, but I haven't had a chance to read it yet. This was so cool. This has elements of like um, Demon Slayer. It has some elements of like Avatar The Last Airbender. It has some elements of like Mistborn. Um, it just has all of these cool things mixed together in this like Asian fantasy story. It also like uh, deals with things like uh, colonization. It has like a romance plot to it. It just was so many things and it has like really cool action sequences and dealing with, uh, you know, using like chi and using this like magic and um, summoning really cool like ancestral beasts and 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 monster, these really cool fantasy creatures. And there just, there were so many things that I liked about this book. It was like such a roller coaster. Uh, and, you know, there's like one character who has like a, a dark, like a de I think it was a demon, like a demon inside of him uh, and like had to deal with that. And it just, it combines... Sometimes I, I often think like, oh man, I, I wish I could find books. I want to read more books that emulate like manga and anime and the stories that I like from those. And this did that really, really well. And it was also just like really well written. Uh, it, it, at times it was beautiful. At times it was heartbreaking. At times it was like action packed and like edge of your seat. Like what's going to happen? In the book, we follow Lan and Zen and they are sort of, they sort of like meet each other and one realizes that the other has a lot of power and the other one realizes that the other one is like, pretty strong and so they end up working together but of course you know they also start having feelings for each other and they just go on this like journey and they're being 
chased by uh, these people who have basically like taken over their land. Like I said, it has like some really like colonization, uh, some heavy colonization themes. And uh, what's interesting is that there are magic practitioners uh, of this old land, but then there are also magic practitioners of in the like of the colonizers. They have their own magic practitioners, and seeing the different ways that they like they both have their own like magic system. And I thought that was really cool. And it kind of reflects. I don't want to give too much away, but it kind of reflects the history of their peoples and like how they came to find magic. And I thought that was really interesting. And that part is where it kind of gets into like it's almost like. Avatar The Last Airbender meets the magic system of Mistborn a little bit by Brandon Sanderson, and I thought that was really cool. I just thought this was such a ride. I haven't read the second book yet. This definitely, so if you've been here before, you know that I sometimes complain, especially in the YA space, how books that are in a duology or a trilogy, the first book won't necessarily have an ending. Uh, it will just end like after the second act and you're expected to read the next book to kind of figure out what the third, like what happens in the third act or like what happens next. And that drives me crazy. I think a book should be a, should be a very complete like beginning, middle, end, even if it is part of a series. Uh, and this definitely has that beginning, middle, end feel, but it does have a cliffhanger. It is a duology. So it is. it does leave you on a what's going to happen next, but it still has a very like clear, like climactic, um, epic finishing part of the story uh, that I was just like, what? <laughs> the whole time it's happening. It has some really good plot twists. There was one that like made me gasp out loud. Uh, there's, there's just some, it, this is just like such a fun action adventure but it also has a lot of really important messaging um, around, you know, culture and the, you know, what it means to like eradicate a people's culture and how those people will fight back when their culture is being um, threatened in that way. Uh, and what it means to people's culture that is being taken away, like how they see the oppressor in that situation and how the oppressor looks at the people that they are taking the culture away from. It deals with all of that. So it, not only is it like a really fast paced, like, thrilling adventure story that it combines all of these things I really like from like other stories but it also has like a really really good a really really interesting I don't want to say good message it has like a really interesting and important message uh that it is conveying through this storytelling as well and also this is the first thing I've ever I've ever read by Emily Wen Zhao but I loved her writing like her writing was like stunning I thought it was really beautiful the way she describes things I just felt so transported like I was really in this world uh, I felt like I could smell it I feel like felt like I could taste it like I could see it uh, and I was like very impressed so now I want to read I want to read everything she's written now because I just was blown away specifically by the writing I think in like action adventure stories sometimes the writing is like a means to an end right like you don't necessarily notice the how like the how good or bad the writing is because you're just on this like fast-paced adventure but in this book there were moments that I just I really noticed like the the writing was just really poignant and really stunning and I thought that was very special Song of Silver Flame Like Night like I said first in a duology both books are out so you can read both of them you don't have to wait for the next one in the series they're both available now but I loved this this was easily one of my favorite things I read this month it was really good next up we have The Nickel Boys so this was uh the the other book that I read this month that had been sitting on my shelf uh for years I all my books are arranged as a rainbow so the books that I'm reading right now all have white spines because they're all up at the top of my shelf. Uh, so this is the first thing I've ever read by Colson Whitehead. And this book is definitely, it's it's not nonfiction, but it is based on something nonfictional. Uh, so we follow a young man, uh, a young black man, and he is, you know, he's like a really good kid. And he's seen by his family and by his community is like a really good kid. He is going above and beyond. He loves learning. He is going, uh, he's getting ready to go to college and he hitchhikes to go to his first day of taking college courses and the car gets pulled over and the person who was driving the car like stole the car and they end up put, like, like this kid ends up having to take some of that blame, even though he had nothing to do with it which sucks. And so he gets sent to this like reformatory institute place like for young men. And the book explores, you know, just the awfulness of that situation and the awfulness of those institutes because it's based on like real places like this. You see the abuse that these kids went through. You see, you know, these like horrible, horrible things that were happening to these kids to the point where they felt like they had to like run away or like were looking for ways out or uh, just like horrible, and, and the way that these systems, the book also kind of touches on the way that these systems are not actually meant to rehabilitate people. Like even though they say they are, they they don't send people back out into the world like ready to be part of the world. And a lot of these kids would just end up coming back because they aren't given, even though they're like, we're giving you the skills to go out and make something of yourself. They're not really doing that. They're just making these kids like terrified all the time. And so it really explores all of that. Uh, obviously, I thought this book was really well written. I thought the subject matter uh, was 
incredibly heartbreaking, but also you know, I think it's important to to put the the light on things like this that happened. I think it's really important to call out these things because these things have happened all over and not just in uh, the US, but we've also seen them happen in other countries and not only just to black people, like this takes place in the six, 1960s. So it's also dealing a lot with like segregation um, and racism and things like that. But even, um, you know, things like the 60s scoops and the things that we saw happening um, in Canada with indigenous people, which was also happening, happening here. Um, this reminds me of all of that. And it's, it's just, it's horrifying um, to see, and it's, it's terrifying to read about it. I think the hope with stories like this is that the more you shed light on it, the more you talk about it, the more you bring attention to how awful it was. For me personally, it's like, as far as a story goes, I, I felt like, it did feel like the third act of this book feels very rushed. Like the first two acts of this book, and it is split into three parts. So the first two parts of this book, uh, feel like very much setting up the story, kind of telling us about this horrible place, uh, getting us like in the mindset of like why it's so awful. And then the third act just feels like this very rushed, like get to the finish line. <laughs> like it's just, I was like, uh, like the third act is like you blink and you miss it. Uh, it's so fast. And I feel like because of that, the the weight of the book kind of gets dropped a little bit. And I, I that made me a little sad. I, I feel like the third act was over so quickly that it, it kind of, it just doesn't quite stick the landing. It is saved by like a, there's a really incredible plot twi twist in the third act that was like, what? Um, but even that, like, it's, it's so quick that again, you blink and you miss, you'll miss it. Uh, but it, but it did help, you know, raise that third act to be at least a little bit more like, whoa. But I thought it was a shame. I feel like this book could have really bene benefited from like an extra 50 pages um, and a little bit more focus on like how, like what ultimately happened uh, at the end of this story because it just felt so fast uh, that I feel like it kind of lost some of the weight and the importance of, of what it of what it was trying to do for the entire rest of the book that came before it. Uh, I am going to be unhauling this book, not because, I, I thought this book was really good. I mean, despite my feelings about the third act, I thought this book was really, really good and really well written uh, and, and, you know, heartbreaking and upsetting and unsettling, but that's the point. That being said, it's not a book that I think I would ever read again. And by unhauling it, I give someone else the opportunity to read it and learn about these situations. The author has a really excellent author note in the back that kind of goes over what this was based on and how this came to be and, you know, where this story came from. Because like I said, the entire story is fictional, but it is based on very real things that happened um, in, in a lot of different places throughout the US. I don't think I would ever read it again, but I would love to give someone else the opportunity to. So this will be an unhaul for me, uh, but it was a really excellent book and I definitely would recommend it. I, I want to read more now by Colson Whitehead because I, I specifically really liked the actual writing, like the craft of writing of this book. It was really excellent. So yeah, the Nickel Boys. All right, next up, I read How Do You Live? Now I discovered this book uh, because it was, it's, I believe this is the first time this has ever been translated into English. And apparently this was Hayao Miyazaki, the director of like Spirited Away, Howl's Moving Castle. Uh, it was his favorite childhood book. And so I was like, oh, that sounds really cool. I want to read that. And apparently it's very, very popular um, book in, in Japan. So this was recently translated and I wanted to give it a read. And I really, loved this a lot. Like this was one of my favorites this month. I, this book really resonated with me. So the story is, is very like slice of life. We follow a young man, uh, who is kind of between that age of like being a child and being an adult and kind of like trying to figure out his place in the world. Kind of that age where you start to realize that there are other people around you and that they are all different. And that, and there's a whole world of different people doing different things out there. And that's kind of overwhelming. It's kind of like, he's right in that age where you kind of start to realize all of that. We're really just following him in his school days and making friends and, and just what it means to be like a good friend. And also more importantly, what it means to be a good person. So this is interspersed with uh, the young man, his, his, um, father has passed away. And so his guardian is his mom, but then he's also being watched over by his uncle. And his uncle will have these discussions with him that are sort of exploring philosophy and just like different worldviews. Um, and of course, what it means to be a good person. And throughout the book, his uncle is writing uh, in a journal and almost keeping like essays about the different things that he and his and his um, nephew talk about. And so you actually, we actually read these essays. So in between just about every chapter, there's an essay by his uncle that is discussing something that they've talked about in great length. And this goes over all kinds of things. It goes over the history of Buddhism, it goes over the history of like Napoleon and um, you know, was Nap Napoleon was a great leader, but was he a great man? Was he a good person? Like, 
what does that mean? And honestly, there were several chapters where I feel like I learned something about history, which I thought was really cool. Uh, but it's this like really cool mixture of like philosophical essays alongside this slice of life coming of age story. I just thought it was really beautiful. I mean, I think a lot of the essays really are things that made me think a lot. I went to um, an international baccalaureate program. I was in the international baccalaureate program, the IB program when I was in um, high school. And we had to take this course for two semesters or two years, two semesters, no, for two years called Theory of Knowledge. And the, kind of the whole concept of Theory of Knowledge, I wish more people took it because I think now, especially in our day and age with the rise of AI, it would be a very valuable course. But the concept of Theory of Knowledge is like, how do we know what we know, right? And being able to take information and then ask questions, right? Like, okay, well, what is the source? Who is talking, who is giving us this information? Why are they giving this information? Why, what are they leaving out? What are they keeping in? What does that mean? Like, are they biased? What does a biased source look like? What does a biased narrator look like? And this book would have been so good to read during that class because this book is questioning all of those things, right? It's like, well, that you know this person to be a great leader because you've been told they're a great leader, but let's look at what they actually did. Let's look at how they actually changed history. Let's look at how they actually affected the world we live in today. And now let's discuss again, like, what do you think of this person? And I just thought it was so well done and it was so interesting. And it's one of those books where like, nothing really happens. <laughs> Nothing really happens in the book, but the whole time I was just so engaged with the writing and the story and the way that it was uh, discussing these concepts of, you know, being ultimately it came down to like, what does it mean to be a great person and how do you enact that in a world? And if you are a great person, what do you produce for the world? So one of the essays kind of talks about how a lot of people and especially the main character at this time, because he's just like a, like a 15, 14 or 15 year old. Um, he is just like a consumer, right? Like he, everything that he gets from the world he is consuming, he's not producing anything to put back out into the world. Uh, whereas his friend, uh, a lot of, a lot of people look down on his friend because his friend doesn't really have a lot of money and his family owns this fried tofu restaurant. And his friend is like, there, like able to make the fried tofu, able to help his parents, able to, um, cook and take care of the house and the restaurant. And his, so his friend who everybody looks down on ironically is like, the most productive person in their friend group. And he is like putting something back out into the world and creating something. And this is very eye opening to the main character because he's like, Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm really just taking and taking and taking. And this person is like giving something back to the world. And so the book explores all of this. And it just was like a lot of things that would make you just go, huh, interesting. And like, you know, sit back and really think and reading this book felt meditative to me. Like I would sit, I would, when I would come up for air from reading it, I, th I would think about what I just read for hours and hours and hours on. I mean, there's still, there are parts of this book that I'm still thinking about now because I just thought they were so poignant and so revelatory. I thought this was really good. This is one that I think at some point I will reread because I'd love to do an annotation of it. So doing like highlighting, tabbing, all of that fun stuff that I love to do because there were just some really great moments and highlights and quotes of this that I would love to re-explore. So that was How Do You Live. I really like this one a lot. I, I definitely like highly recommend. It was really good. Okay, so the next book we're going to talk about is The Emperor and the Endless Palace. This just came out like at the end of March, and I was very excited about it. And so I read it like the two days after it came out, and I gotta say I did not love it. Uh, I This one was pretty disappointing to me. Now, that's not to say that I think everyone that reads this will be disappointed with it. I've talked to a couple friends that, that really did like it. Um, but I'm going to tell you my reasons for not liking it, and then kind of give you uh, give you some reasons that if you pick it up, you might enjoy it, okay? This story is told in three timelines, and it's sort of about, it's supposed to be about like a timeless, like cursed throughout all of time love story. So we follow these two men um, all the way in like, I think it's like four BCE, um, and then meeting and falling in love. And then you see them again in like, I think it's like 17, the 1700s, uh, yeah, 1740. And then you see them again in modern day. And it's supposed to be kind of this story of like, um, cursed love and reincarnation and like finding your loved one again and again in every single life. That's what the book is supposed to be about. <laughs> and it kind of is, but uh, my problems with it were a few. So first of all, I think this book, this book is one of the most mismarketed books I've ever read in my entire life because it is marketed as this very, uh, like this beautiful across stars and time romanticy. And it just really isn't. There's very little actual romance in the book. Uh, there's quite a lot of smut. There's quite a lot of spiciness. And but there's there's really not like a lot of like romance that leads up to that. There's just like a lot of there's just like a lot of smut for smut's sake. And 
I, I'm not shaming that. Like, I have read plenty of books that were, like, smut for smut's sake and, like, fully and completely enjoyed them. But when I read, like, a romanticy, I expect there to be some romance <laughs> in the antecy, like, like, the romance part of the antecy, right? Like, and this book, there just wasn't. Like, there, every time the character, like, at, there's one point in the modern day storyline where one of the characters is like, I'm in love with you. These two characters have known each other at that point for like less than 12 hours. And they met like on a dating app and then they went out to a club and like lost each other, like didn't even see each other because they were like busy, like doing some substances at the club. And then when they finally find each other, the one is like, I'm in love with you. I'm like, what are you talking about? Are you insane? Uh, it just, it just did not click for me. There was no point in any of the three storylines where I was like, wow, they're really in love. Uh, there just wasn't. Like, it, a lot of it was just, they would meet, and then they would, you know, they would, there would be some spicy scenes, and then we would go on, and there'd be some drama. Uh, so I think that was a big miss for me, is that I just didn't feel like there was any, like, actual romance in these storylines. Uh, and here's the thing, is, again, I think, it, okay, so let's just say this is, like, mis mismarketed, right? And so now that we're just saying, like, this should have just been marketed as, like, you know, a spicy... Uh, MM romance. Okay, great. Love that. I'm I'm all about it. I'm in. I'm sold. But even like the spicy scenes, I didn't feel like were written all that well. Uh, one thing that like was really a highlight to me <laughs> was that one of the one of the characters uh, in the I think it's in the 1740 timeline. He is like uh, his whole thing is he's like going to court and like trying to like um, gain favor and gain influence, like get closer and closer to the emperor uh, and be in the emperor's court. And so he refers to his uh, ma the, the, his, his male parts as his influence. <laughs> and that is like the only word he uses to describe that part of his body is his, in so every time he refers to it, he calls it his influence, which was, was so weird to me. <laughs> I was like, well, you don't know any other words for that thing. There's so many. Read a Katie Robert book. There are so many words you could be using other than influence. So, that, so even like the spicy scenes to me were like very, very, very jarring. And finally, I think the thing that really sent this home to me as, as a book that just was not for me is that I didn't, I didn't like any of the characters. I thought they were all so awful. They were so awful to each other. They were so awful to themselves. They were just, they just, and they just made so many stupid awful decisions. Uh, in particular, the character in, in present day, like his sister cares so much for him and she is always reaching out and he just like is always like ignoring her, like putting her, like ignoring her calls, putting her on silent, like making her worry. And at no point does he rectify that. At no point does he say, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry for making work. Like he just continues to do it. Even by like the last chapter, he is like ignoring her calls. He's just awful. And I feel like all of the main characters are really terrible. At no point do I, I didn't care about any of them. And I, I didn't want any of them to find a happy ending because they were all just like miserable. <laughs> and, and I, I just, you know, I talked about this with the Atlas six. I just am not a fan of, of there are stories out there about hot people being awful to each other and then hooking up with each other. And the Atlas six was that kind of story to me. And this was kind of that story to me. And I just, I want to care. I, I like stories where I care about the characters. That's not to say that characters can't make mistakes and do bad things. And, and, but I need to see them grow and I need to see them uh, learn from it. And I just felt like none of the characters in this book really grew or changed or evolved in any way. I think if you go into this book, just, and, and you're still interested in reading it, I think just be aware that it is very much a spicy MM book and it does have some fantasy elements it does so there are some aspects of fantasy and there are some aspects of reincarnation and i actually did find those moments of the book where we were having a little bit of the fantasy elements and also where we were talking about like reincarnation and like the idea of you and the person your like soulmate reincarnating over time those were my favorite parts of the book those are the parts of the book that made me go oh that's interesting i like where this is going but they were very few and far in between, and I just wish there had been more of them. This book was a big miss for me. I feel like so often in the book, I really tried. I really tried to like this because I really wanted to like this because when I heard about this and I saw this cover, I was like, I'm going to love this book. Like, this book sounds incredible. And I just, every time there was a moment where I was like, ooh, okay, we're, okay, we're okay, we're getting on track. I'm liking this more. I'm liking this more. Something would happen where I'd be like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> and and so it was a miss for me. Maybe you'll love it. Like I said, I, I do want to mention what I said at the beginning of this review. I have a couple friends who have read this who loved it. So if you are still interested in it, definitely check it out on your own. Make your own decision because there are, I've talked to people who really enjoyed this. It just was definitely not for me, very sadly.
because I really wanted it to be for me. <laughs> Okay, next up we have Most Ardently. Now this has been on my shelf for a little while and uh, I didn't really get to participate that much in the Trans Rights Readathon this month uh, that happened on a lot of social media because I just was so busy, but this was like the one book that I got to read for it. And I loved this book so, so, so much. So basically the concept of this book is very simple. Uh, it takes the story of Pride and Prejudice and reimagines Elizabeth's character as a trans man named Oliver. And through that lens, it explores, you know, the world of Pride and Prejudice through the eyes of a trans man, with Darcy, of course, being a gay man, which works very well, not surprising. And it also, like, explores queerness at the time uh, that all of this takes place. So we talk about things like Molly Houses, how people looked at, like, queer people and queer relationships and things like that. But it does all of that while still be being a very hopeful and beautiful and positive book. I loved that about this book. I love that this explored the historical elements, but still gave us a very like trans, positive, happy, hopeful, joyful story. Uh, I thought that was really special. I've seen some critiques that people don't like that it because they feel like it's unrealistic that these characters would have this very like happy, like ha like would have a happy ending in this time period, but I don't care. <laughs> I, I like that it had a happy, joyful ending. I like that this was a positive, happy book. Uh, I liked getting to see these characters be happy uh, in the end of their story, much like in Pride, of, Pride and Prejudice. I don't really feel like that's a spoiler because if you've read Pride and Prejudice, you kind of know how this book is going to end. Obviously, they go through some different ropes because, you know, Oliver is trans and Darcy is a gay man. So we do see some different storylines happening, but it is ultimately following... Um, the structure of Pride and Prejudice. And I think if you've read Pride and Prejudice, there are a lot of little fun little Easter eggs and little like nods to the original in this that I thought were really fun and really good and really well done. But I, I really liked that it had that historical element, but didn't give these characters this like doomed awful ending because of how their story probably would have actually gone in a historical setting. I don't really care. I want to see more stories in historical settings like this that have happy endings for the characters uh, because it was beautiful and it was adorable and I loved it. Queer people deserve happy endings in stories regardless of what time period they're set in. It doesn't have to always be traumatic and sad and upsetting. It Sometimes we just need, like queer people, we just need some joy. And this book brought the joy and it brought it just in just the best way. I loved this. I, I don't know why I put off reading this. I got this a while ago. I, people were talking about it saying it was good. I knew I would probably like it because I really liked Gabe's last book. But man, it was so good and it was so lovely. And I just, my little heart went pitter patter for them. Like, I, I just, I just loved them. It was such a cute, wholesome, lovely story. And if you like Pride and Prejudice, like, I know there's a million Pride and Prejudice retellings out there, but, but, but one more, you have to read one more because this was just so good. I, five out of five, no notes. I loved this book so much. Most ardently, highly recommend. Okay, next up, I read Kindling by Tracy Chi. Now, I was really excited about this book because Tracy Chi wrote a book called A Thousand Steps Into, uh, Thousand, A Hundred Steps Into Night? A Thousand Steps Into Night? Oh no, I can't remember the name of it and I don't see it on my shelf. Oops. But I, whatever uh, Tracy Chi's last book was, I loved that book. It's one of, it was one of my favorite of the year it came out. It was in my top five of that year. I loved it. I still don't know what I think of this book. I still can't figure it out. I sometimes loved it. I sometimes didn't like it, but I mostly liked it. It was all over the place. This story reminds me a lot of kind of the story of the samurai. So after this like big war, there are these, they, during this war, they had like enlisted these kids and like charged them up with this like magical energy and then sent them out to fight this war. And essentially this energy would like basically eat up at them and like burn them out at a certain point. They almost turned them into like little like super batteries. They were like really strong until they like burnt out. Um, and so this is after the war and we see like what has happened to these, to these uh, young people. And they are now just like trying to live their life, even though a lot of their life has kind of been stolen from them and the government like the just no longer needs them. So they're just trying to like live a normal life despite having this trauma, despite having these abilities that they can't really use because if they use them, they're going to burn themselves out um, and they're going to have shortened lives anyway. And so we end up seeing them kind of, the seven of them kind of coming together to go on what initially when it happens, I thought it was like a side quest. I was like, oh, this is gonna be like a little introductory quest to get them all together, which is to go and like protect this town that is about to be attacked. And it turns out that is like the main storyline of the whole book. They are gonna go protect this town that is about to be attacked. And that is the entire book is like preparing for and then dealing with that attack. That was the first thing that was a little off-putting was I was like, oh, this is like a little side mission to get them started. But then it ended up being this like way bigger thing. This is not a book about like the end of the world. This is not a book about like, 
I, I think it also didn't help that I had just read Song of Silver Flame Like Night, which is very much like this big, grand, epic adventure. This is a much quieter story. In fact, this most of the first like two thirds of this book, there's almost no action. It's very much introducing these characters, seeing their relationships with each other, seeing their past, seeing their relationships with themselves, and then and exploring all of that until we get to like this big climactic moment where they have to protect this town. I think part of my not sure about this book came from me going in with different expectations and then frequently throughout the book expecting something and then getting something different. I expected like a big grand epic story and I did not get that. I instead got a much more like interpersonal character driven story, which is not a bad thing, by the way, it just wasn't what I was expecting. The book is told in second person. So even though the, each chapter jumps between these different characters, the book, uh, the, the narrator always is like saying you, so you do this, you do that, you do this, but referring to whichever character that chapter is about. And there are seven characters. So jumping between seven characters was a lot. And for the, I'm not gonna lie, for the first half of the book, I was so easily confusing the different characters. Like I was like, wait, which one is, which one is that? Which, who is that? Which one is this? In the second half I started, to, I really got it. I was like, okay, this is this person, this is this person. But it's a lot of characters for like, not a super long book to like try and keep straight. So that was another thing that I was like, oh God, the, uh, the first like two, like I feel like the first third of the book, it felt like every chapter they were introducing a new character. I was like, are we ever gonna check back in with anybody? Because this is a lot of characters and all at once, it was a lot. So there's all of that and we're dealing with like the trauma of these characters and we're dealing with them like basically trying to figure out their lives in this new world that just, that doesn't really need them, even though they are completely to thank for being, for this world being the way that it is. Once I settled into the second half of this book and really understood what it was and what it was trying to do is when I finally started to like enjoy it. But the first half of the book was just spent with me going, wait, what's going on? Who is this character? What's happening? What are we doing? Once I got past all of that, I, it was, I really enjoyed it. And I will say Tracy, she, I love Tracy's writing. Like the, the writing is just on point. Like there's some moments that are just so heartbreakingly good. This is a very traumatic book. Like this is, this is like, especially towards the end, I was like, <gasps> like, it's a very stressful, this is the opposite of Most Ardently. This is not a happy book. This is a very stressful, traumatic book. And it's a book about trauma, right? So it's a book about recovering from trauma and like what trauma does to our lives after it happens and how it continues to affect our lives no matter how long ago that trauma uh, happened to us. So it shouldn't be a happy book. Like I, I think the weight of what it's trying to talk about is very, very good and very reflective of the story it's trying to tell. So I say all of that to say that if you're going to read this book, give it some time. This is a book that you've gotta, as, as the young people say, you gotta let it cook, <laughs> okay? You gotta let this book marinate a little bit because it takes a while before it really like before you really get into it. Uh, it definitely is like a slow burn of a book. It, it is a very like plot, like plot wise and pacing wise is it, a, it is a very slow book. I am so glad I stuck with it. I'm so glad I made it to that second half because by the end of the book, it was very much worth me reading through the whole thing. But it is a book that took a lot of time for me to, to for me to like. First half of the book was, was a chore to get through, but it was a chore worth getting through because I ended up really enjoying this book by the end of it. I feel like we could have used a couple less characters and I feel like that first half could have used a little bit of tightening because it definitely was hard to push through that first half. But it, again, if you're someone who's like reads a couple of chapters and gives up on, and is like, no, I'm not going to read this because I'm not into it. This might not be for you, but if you're someone who's like willing to sit down and give this book the time it needs to like really get going, I think you might really enjoy this because it is, it is very unique. It's very special. I kind of love that it wasn't about like a big end of the world scheme. Like it ended up being much more about a, sto a story, like a story about people just trying to live, like just trying to live, just trying to recover, just trying to make it in a world that used to need them and now no longer even wants them. And I, when I finally realized that was the story I was reading, I really liked it quite a bit. So that is Kindling. Okay, we've got just a couple more. Next up is the Kamigawa Food Detectives. Okay, look at this cover. It's so cute. So this is, uh, if you've read things like Before the Go Coffee Gets Cold, this kind of has like a similar structure. So it's a bunch of like little short stories and we follow these two like detectives and their whole thing is you go to them and you say, ah, when I was 12, my mother made me this stew and it was the best thing I've ever tasted and I've never been able to find a stew that was made exactly exactly the same as that. Can you help me? Can you help me figure out the recipe so that I can remake this mother's, my mother's stew that was just like the best thing in my life. Okay. And then these detectives go and they like figure out how to make that dish. 
uh, and then they make it for the person and then they go through the process of telling them like where the ingredients came from, why it tastes so different than your than the normal, like why does this udon taste so much better than the udon you normally get, right? You know, they talk about the nostalgia factor of it and they talk about, uh, you know, what makes ingredients special, what makes cooking things a certain way different than cooking things another way. And you, of course, get to know these different characters who are coming to the aid and coming to these detectives. You get to know a little bit about their stories, about their past as, as people. And it's very cozy and very chill and very low stakes. My, I really, I did really like this a lot. My only complaint is after the first, like, two cases, the, the structure and kind of the, the gimmick of the book, to me, it I felt like it wore off really quickly. I was like, oh, cool, cool. So you go and you give them uh, a thing, you know, like a recipe you want them to try and figure out. And then they go and they figure it out. And then they like tell you how, you know, to do it and why they did all those things. And then, and then you watch that happen almost exactly the same, but with like a couple different, with like four different characters. Like, I think there are five different cases in the book. So it kind of feels like a rinse and repeat book. Like you, you end up seeing kind of the same thing happen with like slight variations like five times in a row. And at no point are the stories that different. So I felt like I could have easily just read just like the first short story, like the first story, the first case, and kind of known how the entire rest of the book was going to go, because it never really like shakes up the formula. It's a very like by the book formula, like, I come to you, here's what I want. That's part one of each story. And then part two is we found it. Here's what it is. Here's how we made it. <laughs> and so it kind of does the same thing. Like, over and over and over again. So if you read this, maybe what I would suggest is don't don't read the whole thing like in one sitting. Read one case, put the book aside. A month later, come back, read the second case. Like have it as a book that is by your bedside at night. Like you know that book that you don't necessarily read every single night, but you just read when you get a hankering for it. Or like put it in a place where some every once in a while you'll be sitting in that place and you'll need something to read. And this is a good one to pick up every now and then. Because I think if you read it straight in a row like I did, you're going to feel like you're reading the same story five times in a row, uh, but in a very short book, <laughs> which was like a weird experience. It was like, oh, okay, we're doing this again. Oh, oh we're doing, okay, we're doing this again. <laughs> like it was just like very much like, over and over and over and over. Uh, so I would recommend reading it in parts over time. And I think you might like it a little bit more if you do that that way. But it was very cute, very cozy. And if you like food, it's I loved it. So yeah, uh, the next one is The Three Body Problem. Uh, if you've seen my short content, you know how I felt about this book. I'm not going to talk a lot about this one because I don't really have a lot to say other than this was not for me. I really tried. I when, when I read the first like couple of chapters, I was like, Oh, okay, this is kind of weird. I don't know if I'm into this. I will say I wanted to give up and uh, just not finish this book almost the entire time I was reading it. I'm surprised I got to the end of it, if I'm being perfectly honest, because this book did so little for me. It's a there's a there's a TV show coming out uh, for it, or I think it just came out. And we really wanted to watch the TV show. We still will probably give the TV show a chance. Uh, so of course, I was like, well, I want to read the book first. And man, I did not like it at all. This is like very like intellectual sci-fi. It's a lot of like math and science and physics. And at points, I feel like the book kind of just assumes that you know a lot about the physics that it's talking about, which I don't know a lot about the physics that it's talking about. So I had to do, I did a lot of like research and I had to look up a lot of things to kind of understand what was going on. And it's also a book where you won't, it's one of those books where you won't know what's really going on until about the last third of the book. And then you're like, oh, and I will say the revelation of like what's happening and how it reveals all that, I did think was really cool. Like it had a really cool way of revealing like what was actually going on in the story. But by the time we got to that, I just didn't care enough because I really did not like any of the characters. I really did not like the structure of the story. I really didn't like that. I felt like I kept having to like kind of put the book down to like research a topic to be able to really understand what we were talking about. Cause I didn't want, I didn't want to not like the book because it was like, because certain elements of it, the physics parts of it were going over my head. Like I wanted to give it its chance and I wanted to understand what it was trying to say. But ultimately the other weird thing is like, ultimately I feel like those things that I researched and those things that I learned to understand the book didn't actually matter that much. Uh, <laughs> in the scheme of like what was actually going on in the story. There are some really interesting ideas here. If you like like really intense, really like nitty gritty science sci-fi, I'm sure you'll love this. I mean, uh, people, there are tons of people who love this. This has a huge fan base. Uh, it just wasn't, it wasn't for me. I, 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 I'm finding more and more that it's, it's harder for me to like sci-fi than fantasy. With fantasy, I'm very much able to just go along for the ride. And I oftentimes really enjoy fantasy. 
even if I don't love a fantasy book, I'll usually enjoy it. But with sci-fi, I'm finding more and more that I it's very like love it or hate it for me when it comes to sci-fi. And this was a hate it. <laughs> I really did not like this book. But I know a lot of people do. So I would, if you're going to jump into this, just know that it's a really, really thinky, really nitty gritty details, physics and sci-fi type book. Uh, and just also it, you can't be someone who needs to like love the characters. Like if you're someone who like reads books because you want to read about characters that you love and identify with and care about, this is not the book for you. They're all pretty terrible. Um, but if you're okay with that and the science thing, I think you'll really like this one. So that is the three body problem. All right, that brings us to our last book, which was actually the first book that I read this month, which was Lore of the Wild. I I love this cover so much. This book, again, is another one that I'm still not sure how I feel about. I have mixed feelings. There are times that I loved this book, and there are times where I was like, why, why? <laughs> like, who who made this choice? It's a story about this girl who ends up getting captured by the Fae, and she goes to them, and she goes with the Fae, and they have this, like, magical library that they want her to do research in because they think there's some really important information in there and she's able to like go in there and like learn the information from the library but then things happen so she ends up escaping uh with this fey man but then you know they meet someone else so there's like a love triangle element to it i don't want to give too much away so i liked the characters of the story especially the main character lore i really liked her a lot and i liked the two like male love interests quite a bit too i really liked all the characters the characters i was i was i thought were really great i loved the magical world element of the story and there were some moments especially like a magical library that was like really into it. Uh, I think my issues with this book came in two forms. Uh, one was the pacing. I thought the pacing was really rough. Uh, there were times where the book, there were times where the book like went so fast. I was like, whoa, what just happened? And there were times where the book like seemed to drag on and on and on. And also it felt like the story kind of wanted to be in a lot of different places at once. And I kind of wanted it to settle into like one, one aspect. Like at times, this was a story that was, this kind of had like a Beauty and the Beast element, right? Of being captured and dealing with this magical library. And I was like into that. But then it was like more of like a journey, almost like road trip type story. And I kind of wanted it to like pick a lane. You know what I mean? Like pick a, pick a, pick an avenue and commit. And so the pacing of this one was really challenging for me. I do believe this is the first in a series. And I will, I, I should note, I will absolutely be reading the next one, even though I, do, I don't think this one was like, my favorite book ever. Uh, I had, I, for me, this was just like a very okay book. The other thing that was an issue for me, and this is, I want to note, this is fully on me, okay? Fully my fault. Looking at this cover and reading the first like half of the book, I was fully in my head, I thought this was a young adult fantasy. Then I got to a very spicy scene and I was like, whoa, and it wasn't. Uh, and it, it is not marketed as a young adult fantasy. Like I looked it up, it is marketed as an adult romanticy that was on me, but it was also, it definitely was like very like shocking. And I will say these, the story and the writing do feel kind of more YA to me. And I'm not saying that is a bad thing. I think if you like like the YA, like more YA type writing, like that kind of writing, and you like like the kind of the pacing of YA books, even though the pacing of this one is a little weird, uh, but you want them, you want those stories to be about a, adults and have like an actual like old adult romanticy type story. So if you kind of like that, that mixture, I think you'll probably really like this uh, because there aren't a lot of books out there like that. So what I would say is this is like a new adult book, right? New adult kind of combines the pacing and the writing of YA, but with like adult themes of adult books. And, you know, that's why things like Fourth Wing are so popular because they kind of fall into that new adult uh, category. And this definitely falls to me, fell into that new adult category. But at first I didn't know that. And so I was very surprised when people started whipping things out and I was like, whoa, 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 sir. <laughs> you put that right away right now. <laughs> And then I realized the book I was, that, that what I was reading was meant to be for an adult. And then I was like, okay, okay, I can stay out. <laughs> I think I'm blushing at this point. Lore of the Wild to me is definitely not a perfect book. Uh, it is, I had very mixed feelings about it, but I think if you're interested, it's worth reading. I, I did like this author's writing. I'm interested to see, this is a debut. I'm interested to see what they do in their next book um, and, and how she evolves as a writer and how she evolves this story. I have a sneaking suspicion that this is going to be one of those books in a few years as the, as the series progresses and we get more from this author that we're, this is going to be one of those series where we say things like, well, you just have to get through the first book and then it gets really good. I think we're, I have a sneaking suspicion that we're going to discover that with this book because I feel like there's a lot of things being set up in this first book. And I think when we see the payoff of all of that, it's going to be worth it. But it is one of those books that I think it's, it's a little bit of a challenge to get through pacing wise, but I, I, I have faith that it's going to get better and that, it, that 
in a few years we'll look back at this and be like, oh yeah, well, Lore of the Wilds was the debut. You just, you get through that and then, wow, the series is just great. I think that's going to be what happens here. So I'm excited to read more uh, from this author and see like what she has in store for us next. And that is everything that I read in March. I read a lot more than I thought I did. I, at one point in the month, I thought, felt like I hadn't read very much of anything, but I actually read quite a bit. I mean, they're all like here on my couch, just sprawled out all over the place. Some good, some bad, some kind of middle of the road. So it was kind of an interesting month. I'm going to be continuing going through my, uh, my shelves uh, in April. So in uh, April, by the end of April, you'll probably see a lot of books with like a white spine or gray spine because those are the top of my shelves. I'm excited to read books that have been on my shelf for a really long time though. And I'm excited to explore that. I think it's going to be a lot of fun and I'll try to make, find a way to make a longer form video of that. Uh, for you guys. But as I said before, uh, if you enjoyed this, please let me know what books that you liked, what books you think you're going to pick up. If you had any different opinions than I did on any of these books, feel free to share that. Just be kind. It's okay for us to have different opinions as long as we're respectful towards each other, right? Um, I would love to know if you've read any of these and what your thoughts were on them. Uh, I do a lot of fun things on my channel here. I talk about books, but I also do board game playthroughs. I also do scrapbooking. So if you enjoyed this, my lights just dimmed. That was weird. If you enjoyed this, I would love to see you back. So make sure to like and subscribe. And that way I can see you again next time. So thank you so much for watching. And of course, as always, happy reading.